All right, so now we're going to talk about another feature of ternary fa phase diagrams known as compatibility triangles. All right, so compatibility triangles, as they sound, are triangles, uh, and they join three solid phases that are at equilibrium um, at a critical point. And so I'm going to walk you through how we find compatibility triangles uh, for a given phase diagram. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is we have a ternary phase diagram in front of us. What we're going to do is identify all the invariant points. So again, those invariant points are where boundary curves meet up to a single point. So E and P in this case. So those are our two invariant points. And so the next thing we're going to do is start with one of those invariant points at a time, and we're going to identify all the primary phase fields that surround the invariant point. So let's take a look at E. So if I look at all the primary phase fields that surround it, I have alpha, AC, and beta. Those are my three primary phase fields. So that's step two. Step three is we're going to join the composition of the phases that were involved in those primary phase fields. So what I mean by that is um, alpha was the first primary phase field I, I mentioned. So the composition of that phase is pure A. So the point here. For beta, the composition is pure B. And for AC, the composition is this compound AC down here. And so what we do is we take those three compositions, A, B, and AC, and join them together, and that forms a triangle. So basically the triangle formed by AC to A to B. And so here they've already kind of done that work for us and shown this dashed line represents the compatibility triangle for that region. So that's how we do it. And we can do that for all the invariant points on the diagram. So if we do it again and look at um, for point P, P is surrounded by AC, beta, and gamma. So again, AC is down here, beta is down here, and then gamma, the only new one we have, it has a composition of pure C. And so we're gonna join those three points, AC, B, and C. And this triangle is going to be the small one on the bottom side of this dashed line. And so that's the prime, that is the compatibility triangle for the paratectic, whereas the triangle up here is the compatibility triangle for the eutectic. So we can do it for each invariant point we have. So the more invariant points, the more compatibility triangles that we're going to have. So like I said, kind of showing you the, the procedure that we have. So this red triangle is what you see for the eutectic. And then for the paratectic, again, identifying the three primary phase fields surrounding that invariant point, and then identifying the compositions of those and making a triangle connecting those three compositions. All right, so one of the important things about compatibility triangles um, is that it tells us the solidus temperature uh, for that um, reaction. And so um, I want to sort of show you the binary just so that we can kind of think about the, the same thing. All right, so I showed you this before where we have the, the primary phase fields uh, identified, but then we also have, um, in this case, the compatibility line because it's a binary system. So it's not a triangle, it's a line. So in these cases, the compatibility lines uh, can be uh, formed in a similar way, but in essence, uh, for those two reactions, the uh, line for the paratectic is here, and the line for the eutectic is here. And so what that shows us, if we, if we look at these two lines, is that below that green line, we have no liquid, so it's 100% solid, and above it we start to form liquid. Same thing over here, all solid below, uh, then we start to form liquid. So that is the liquidus uh, temperature for that reaction. And so that's useful to know for these materials.
So this can tell us the solidus temperatures um, of those reactions. All right, so this tells us the solidus temperature in ternary, the, the critical temperature of that invariant point. So above, uh, so basically where that reaction occurs on the diagram. All right, so now what we're gonna do is I've got a new example for us. And so this is a, a different phase diagram than the ones you've seen. Uh, but what I want you to do is identify all the invariant points that we have, draw the compatibility triangles, and then see if you can determine whether they are eutectic or paratectic uh, reactions. So um, take, a, take a few minutes uh, to do this uh, and see what you can come up with. Um, uh, again, pause the video uh, and then uh, I'll come back and we'll sort of work through this together. All right, uh, we're back and we're gonna take a look at this uh, question I had for you about uh, drawing the compatibility triangles and determining whether we have eutectic or paratectic. So first of all, let me exit out of the screen and I'm gonna move to the next slide where I have a blank one and we'll work through this together. So the first thing is we want to uh, identify the invariant points before we can do anything. So in this case, there's three, or sorry, there is two where the where three boundary curves meet up. One of those would be X here, and then the other one would be Y. Those are the only two places where we have three boundary curves meeting up. And so those are our invariant points. So I'm gonna start with X. So for X, the, the next step was to determine the primary phase fields around it. And so the, the primary phase fields are for those solids. So in this case, it actually gives you the liquid here, but the other name tells you what the solid is. So we have this, I'm just going to abbreviate them, the N phase, the C phase, and the P and the B phases. So for X, we have N, P, and C. So those are our three primary phase fields around the point X. And so the next step is to find the compositions and then draw a triangle connecting those three compositions. So I'm gonna to go to the draw and I'm gonna make some lines connecting those. So for the end phase here, that looks like it's the end member component for this, for N. So that's just the, the, the corner of the triangle. Same thing for the C phase here, it looks like it's the corner of the triangle. And then for this P phase, the composition of that looks to be right here uh, at this point. And so I'm gonna draw a triangle between those three points. So the between the N and C to start with, and this might not look perfect, so please forgive me for this. Um, I'm going to also change the color so you can see it a little bit better. Maybe make it a little bit thicker. All right. So that's one of the sides of the triangle. Then the other would be from C to P. And then the last part would be from N to P, right? So those were the compositions of the three phases around the invariant point X. So basically this uh, uh, red triangle is the compatibility triangle for X. And so let me just write that so that that you have that as a reference. All right, so now let's th look through Y. So for Y, it has the C phase and the P phase in common, but instead of N, it has B. And so that's the only difference here. So it's going to share those two points, C and P, but instead of the point up here, it's going to have it down here at P. So now let's go ahead and draw what that's going to look like. 
So starting at P, going to B, sorry, starting at B, going to P, and I'm going to change the color of that so that maybe we can see a little bit better. And then same thing, I'll make it a little bit bigger. All right, uh, next we're going to go, it'll go from B all the way to C. And then the last leg of that is going to be from P to C. So it's going to share that part of the triangle. So basically, this bottom portion was the green for point Y. So those are our two compatibility triangles for this diagram. And if you would have looked, if you look closely at that diagram from the previous slide, you'll notice that the little dashed line is already there. So it's already kind of giving you the compatibility uh, lines for um, for this. So we've answered two of the parts. We've gone through and calculated or drawn the compatibility triangles. And now the last part, we need to determine that whether it's a eutectic or paratactic reactions for X and Y. And so I've kind of given you two ways in which we could have solved this so far. One of them is by looking at the arrows on the boundary curve. And if they flow towards the point, all of them, then that's a eutectic. And then if one of them flows away, that's a paratactic. Well, this one doesn't, uh, as you kind of look here, there's no arrows on the boundary curves. And that's pretty common for most ternary phase diagrams. And so we're gonna have to use the other method using compatibility triangles. And so if I look at X, and I wanna know if this is um, eutectic or paratactic, the way I can do this is to see where it is in relation to its compatibility triangle. And so X is within its own compatibility triangle. And so this is a eutectic reaction. And so I'm gonna write that for you here. All right, so let's look at the other one. So let's, let's look at Y. So Y, the point Y, is outside of its own compatibility triangle, and therefore um, it is not a eutectic. So it's going to be the paratactic. So this all kind of goes back to whether something is an incongruent or congruent melting material. Um, so with, um, with uh, eutectics, all the components are congruent. And then in the other case, uh, we have uh, the opposite. So we don't have them lie within their own primary phase fields. All right, the last feature I want us to take a look at on these ternary phase diagrams before we get some, to some operations that will be useful for us is to look at miscibility. And so we described this in terms of the Gibbs free energy and looked at it for a binary case where it forms sort of that dome shape. So you can see that in binary, it has this sort of dome uh, appearance to it. Well, in um, ternary, it's going to obviously look a little different. We've seen most things will look different based on the, the uh, changes in dimensionality. And so in this case, uh, what we t tend to see is, is arcs. And so this is uh, not the best example here. Uh, but in this case, you might see a region up here in our diagram that we've been looking at, which is called two liquids. And so that's a, that's a good uh, indicator that we're going to have liquid-liquid immiscibility, because in that case, we'd have two liquids, just like we saw before. Um, but it has sort of um, an arc shape to it. So it starts here, and the arc kind of goes around uh, up to this point. And so it has the sort of arc appearance to it. Um, and this will also appear above the liquidus temperature. So that's another 
giveaway uh, for what's going to happen if you have liquid liquid immiscibility. It'll be above the liquidus where we have liquids. Um, so that's one way it can manifest itself. Uh, another way you'll see on some diagrams is actually uh, by uh, these sort of concentric ovals or, or domes that we have here, right? So this is kind of showing you the um, the temperature contours of that liquid liquid immiscibility. And so that's another way. So here, and then also this region down here, these are um, uh, immiscible regions where we have two liquids instead of one. So there's actually this region, this region, and then another region down here where we have that happen. So just keep uh, keep, a, keep that in mind when you're looking through these diagrams. If you see anything that, that looks like one of these regions or the one on the previous graph, that's what we're looking at. It's gonna be a temperature above the liquidus and it represents that we have that immiscibility where two liquids form instead of one solution.